those who have seen them, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and this work actually inspired many subsequent uh, 3D creature evolution projects uh, since 1994. Um, so this, the look and the feel of his, of his work has been imitated by many ever since, including uh, my own uh, creatures. And so I, even many of the people who contact me today about my software say that they first got interested because of Carl Sims' creatures. So I'll ask Brian to, uh, to play video number one for you. I'll show you some of uh, Carl Sims' creatures. This demonstration shows virtual creatures that were evolved to perform specific tasks in simulated physical environments. Swimming speed was used to determine survival. Most of the creatures are results from independent evolutions. Some developed strategies similar to those in real life. Once they're evolved, multiple copies of these creatures can be made and simulated together in the same environment. The next group of creatures were evolved for their ability to move on a simulated land environment with gravity and friction. Some simple solutions with just two parts were found. Some seemed like they could use some assistance, while others were fairly efficient, such as this rowing-like behavior. Here is an odd cousin of the previous. A mutation caused him to tumble. Some creatures evolved to incorporate contact sensors in their control systems. Here is another inchworm-like creature that tends to go in circles. This was actually a creature first evolved for its ability to swim in water, then later put on land and evolved further. A successful sidewinding ability resulted. Here is one with a hopping style. The protrusions on its arms seemed to help prevent it from tipping over. This was the fastest, with a successful galloping-like stride. This group was evolved for their jumping ability. This group was evolved for their ability to adaptively follow a red light source. The resulting creatures are now being interacted with. A user is moving the light source around as the creature behaves. This one seems to flail randomly, but somehow still manages to approach the light. Perhaps it is mean to move the goal away just as it arrives. Here is one that has propeller-like fins which are tilted depending on the direction of the light. It can adaptively swim up or down very well. This final group of creatures was evolved for their ability to compete. Thank you. So I thought that's definitely worth watching because, uh, I mean, these are, uh, if you haven't seen these before, these are real videos that had quite an impact uh, both in the field and, and in the public. So if we go to the next slide, um, so I have a project that's very similar. Um, the, the creatures are controlled differently, but essentially it's, a, it's quite a similar project to the stuff of, of Carl Sims. And uh, the biggest drawback with my program is that it's very, very slow. Um, so in order to collect the amount of data that I need, um, I decided to enlist interested volunteers uh, on the Internet. And so my deal was simply uh, that I offer, offer a copy of the software in exchange for uh, donated CPU time. And I've been doing that since uh, November of last year. And I've gotten quite a number of, of uh, people contacting me saying, sure, I'll donate time to your experiments. And uh, I send them a copy of the software. Uh, and so now I have, in a sense, um, a uh, volunteer massively parallel computer uh, working on my software for me, which is quite nice. So if we go to the next slide, um, so far I've had people from uh, 13 different countries contact me. So world domination is not quite done yet. Still a number of countries to go, but at least the 13 shown here. Um, and really, I, I owe these people quite a, a debt of gratitude. Uh, I mean, without their generous help, uh, I really couldn't collect anywhere near uh, the amount of data that I need. So um, this has really been a, a, good, uh, a good way to collect the data for me. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, the creatures that I've got have a, um, a genetic code, a genome, a chromosome, um, that uh, Brian had asked me to, to come up with an estimate of how, how much space would it take to store the genetic material for the creatures. And so using a pretty conservative estimate, so that is I'm, I'm making these things bigger than they really need to be, I sat down and, and, and worked it out and uh, decided that I could encode a pretty good creature in only about 55 kilobytes, essentially. So it's really not an, an incredibly big uh, chromosome. And so the chromosome is set up roughly as the way, the way that you see it here in the slide. There's a bunch of stuff at the beginning, which I won't bother getting into. And then there's a section 
for each of the different types of body parts, essentially. And so in this diagram, we've got body part type 1 has this particular shape, this particular color. The next one has a different shape and color and so on. And there are various other parameters that I won't get into beyond simply shape and color. And so this is what the genome looks like. If we go to the next slide, along with uh, you know, what is the shape of a body part and what is its color, there's also a branching configuration that says whenever you see a body part of this type, it's got um, other body parts of these types sprouting off at these locations and at these angles. And so all of that information is encoded genetically in the chromosome. And so let's say in our hypothetical example here on the slide that part type number one, body part type number one, has a branch of type number one sticking off the top left and a branch of type number two sticking off the top right. And branch number two branches in the way that's shown here. Branch number three, the little purple one, let's say that it has no branches at all sprouting off of it. And then type four has, has the configuration here shown. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, the, what this does then is once you've got this information laid out, you can then, like Lego, snap everything together and you get a, a body that's sort of shaped like a fractal, which is basically just a repeating pattern. And so here we are, we begin with a body part of type number one there at the bottom in the middle, and it branches, those branches then branch, and etc. The branching simply would continue forever, um, but of course I can't have an infinite creature in simulation. So if we go to the next slide, uh, there are a combination of constraints that impose limits on how deep the body can go, how deep can it, can it do this repeating pattern. Some of these limits are simply built right into the system and others are genetic. Uh, and so there's, there are parts of the chromosome that correspond to these limits. And they involve a change in the branching pattern at a certain depth or a limitation on how far they can repeat and so on. And so you might get something like what's shown here. If we go to the next slide, um, all of the body parts are connected by what are called universal joints. And these are just joints that have two degrees of rotational freedom and no twisting. So these are a lot like your wrist. Uh, it can wobble up and down. It can wobble side to side, but it can't actually twist. When you twist your wrist, you're in fact rotating bones in your forearm. You're not actually twisting right at the, the wrist joint. And so they're a lot like that. Um, each body part contains, in fact, its own little brain, which is a, a genetic programming tree. Uh, and those brains control the forces that will be exerted by motors on those joints. So there's a motor, one motor for each degree of freedom. And so there's like a separate little brain that tells it how to wobble up and down, another little brain that tells it how to wobble left and right. And those brains control the movement of the creature. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can imagine the creature as something that takes inputs from the environment and then sends outputs. And the inputs that come into the creature are of three types in, in my simulation there. Are, first of all, incline sensors. So the creature can determine for any of its body parts what angle it's at. That's the incline sensor. Another is contact sensors. So every single body part can tell whether or not it's touching an external object like the ground. And that's, that's a sense that's available to the creatures. And the third is called proprioception. And proprioception is just a fancy term that means uh, a, being able to sense the angle at your joint. And so if there's a creature that has two body parts, it can tell what the angle is of the joint connecting the two. So the creature takes in that input information, processes it using its genetic programming uh, trees, and then sends two outputs to its motors. And those are um, what angle it would like the joint to be at, and the motor attempts to, to push the angle to the joint, the, push the motor to the angle that it says. And the second output to the motors is how hard it's allowed to push. And so that's all it does. The creature just continuously takes these inputs, does its own little calculations, and then sends outputs to its motors. And so if we go to the next slide, which is number 27, I'll show you um, a few of what are my favorite creatures that I've, that I've seen so far. Um, and so this particular one, which I call Jumpy Bug, uh, this was evolved from a population that was first evolved for the ability to jump, uh, and then it was switched for the ability to traverse a rough terrain. Um, and in the video, you'll see the very beginning, you'll see actually how the body evolved over time. And then you'll see the final creature um, moving around a little bit in its world. So I'll get Brian to.